All right, there's still a few people coming in. All right, why don't we uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome to uh, the CBITS Digital Mental Health Webinar, uh, to the first one of 2023. And uh, this is held in collaboration with the Society for Digital Mental Health. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we get started. Um, I want to, we're going to send out a survey to all of the registrants for the webinar, just and it's five questions, it'll take you 10 seconds. And we're just asking a couple of questions about uh, what you want to see uh, in this webinar. So please uh, give us your feedback so that we can uh, make this better for you. Uh, and then Sarah will also be sending it out through the chat uh, in momentarily so that you can also fill it out now if, uh, if you want to. Um, so we're, you know, right before I introduce uh, Megan, I would please, Megan's going to talk for about 20 or 30 minutes. And after that, please put your questions into the Q&A and uh, we will go through those uh, afterwards. So I really, I'm really, really pleased to introduce Megan, Megan Jones-Bell. She is the clinical director uh, and for consumer and mental health at Google. And she has been really working in digital mental health for um, a long, long time. She got her doctorate from the PGSB Stanford PsyD Consortium and then completed fellowships at Yale and at Stanford. Um, and she's specializing in, in the treatment of adolescents and young adults, eating disorders and obesity. Uh, she's been developing digital mental health treatments for a long, long time. She's developed more than two dozen uh, treatments and conducted research globally uh, in the United States, in Europe, in India, and in Brazil. Um, and she, you know, from after Stanford, after she, uh, uh, you know, completed her fellowship at Stanford, she launched one of the first digital mental health companies, Lantern, uh, which had a, a, a good run. And I didn't know this until I was just talking to her right beforehand. But after that, she went to Vienna, where she worked for uh, for for five years, and then came back to this country and uh, took the role of chief strategy and science officer at Headspace. Um, she's had a long-standing commitment to women's leadership through uh, a number of nonprofit boards, and she's also the Health Innovators Fellow with the Aspen Institute. She really was one of the first psychologists, I think, who who made her career in industry. She has a remarkable breadth of expertise in clinical science and design and in industry leadership. And it is, Megan, it is a pleasure to have you here. So please take it away. Well, as someone who's cited your work and built interventions based on it, David, I, I'm really excited to be here um, and and with this this group. Um, I feel like I'm I'm coming home and uh, with this talk. So I'm excited to to tell you pull back the curtain a bit on what Google is doing in in mental health specifically. Sarah, you can put the slides um, up now. We're not seeing them. Sorry. Thank Thank go. you, Sarah. Um, so I. Um, I, I'm excited to tell you about how Google is prioritizing mental health, and I'm going to take you through some examples that illustrate the role that technology can play in meeting this rising need and demand for mental health information and resources. I've also included a little bit um, of framing on how we think about our strategy at the 10,000 foot view. Um, my role at Google is <clears throat> to provide clinical leadership across our consumer products, our consumer health products in general. And then we also have established a center of excellence across the company um, really to bring together and have a shared strategy for mental health and substance use disorder. Um, it's one of the places that Google is working closely across the company um, like we did during the COVID um, pandemic. It was one of the things that really brought the company together. And so we are prioritizing this as a major focus for, for this year um, in, in an ongoing capacity. So um, Sarah, you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, 
So to start, I'd just like to share that we, as we think about mental health, it's important to ground ourselves in a definition of what it really means. And um, we like the WHO definition of mental health is, is more than having or not having a disorder. We all have mental health that is fluid and it changes over time. And this, this definition says mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities can cope with the normal stresses of life, work productively and fruitfully, and is able to contribute to his, her, I'll add, or their community. And we anchor here because this is really the mission behind our work on mental health across Google. We envision a world where every person can attain their full mental health potential. Next slide, please. As we think about Google's role in supporting people in their mental health, we anchor our priorities to user needs. And we really like this dual continuum model as a guide for mental health focused product development because it captures both the WHO definition and a traditional medical model, which is more, as you know, disorder specific. So for those new to this framework, um, it uniquely reinforces the intersection of psychopathology or distress in well being or qual in quality of life, and importantly, shows the potential for realizing a state of well being even while living with or recovering from a, a chronic mental disorder. Next slide, please. And as this audience knows well, the scale of the problem that we are addressing is extraordinary and is only getting worse. These are some of the many problems that we need to work together to solve. Um, from a Google perspective, you know, we have billions of people using our products, engaging with our, our technology on a, a monthly basis. And so in thinking about these numbers, we really have this unprecedented and unique opportunity to meet this, this need um, for mental health information, resources, support at a, at a truly global scale. You can go to the next slide, please. I wanted to double click a bit on how we're thinking about problem definition. And, and this is just to be more specific, um, the, a US focused lens, just so we can double click a little bit more on how we're thinking about defining the complex and intertwined um, problem statements across the mental health continuum and space. So the first category that we're thinking about is healthcare, really around problems of, of access, of provider shortages of fragmented delivery models of these ghost networks that make finding care extremely challenging. We also know that quality is an issue that um, while, um, while people may, may, if you're lucky enough to access care, the quality of that care is very unpredictable um, and is and in many cases not actually yielding the results um, that people need. And um, we know that evidence-based treatments lead to the best results, um, but that many, many individuals practicing um, and supporting individuals don't actually deliver evidence-based treatments and we're still have challenges bringing them to scale. Cost is of, of course a major issue in, in the US and in many countries and the lack of accountability. Um, so the, the, the absence of really scalable um, and widespread measurement um, and diagnostics being more subjective, as well as this fee-for-service fee model in the US that rarely incentivizes or provides accountability for, um, for the outcomes that treatments are delivering. So we, of course, have a great opportunity to shift that um, in, in the way that we're just you know, dis disseminating um, digital interventions, but these are some of the, the problem statements that we've consolidated um, on the healthcare side. For people, we also know that many individuals have lost um, trust in the healthcare system in general, which does in an independently pose a barrier to seeking uh, appropriate specialty care. And then we also have this, this issue of, of low engagement, which is really this kind of customer service problem we have in, in mental health, where the experience of receiving care, especially for people in crisis, can be dehumanizing, it can be traumatic. Um, and so there's a lot of room for improvement that we need to make as a, as a field in terms of more compassionate, humane care um, that, it, you know, for, for especially at the more severe ends of the care spectrum. And then society. So 
the, the issues of stigma, which I'm sure you all know well, and racial injustice um, further complicate um, and are intertwined with the mental health problems. Next slide, please. And so we know that these are enormous problems, they're complex, they're interconnected. Um, a single point intervention is not going to be sufficient. This is um, it's, it's, you know, incredibly heartening to see the increased investment in mental health and attention that it's getting, but demand is just going up and the problem is getting worse. And we see this trend across all of our platforms because Google is often the first place that people turn to for information. And we believe that we have a responsibility to be helpful across individuals' <laughs> mental health journeys. Next slide, please. So as we ideate and develop solutions to address these extraordinarily large and complex challenges, there are decades of research on mental health and digital mental health specifically that we can turn to to inform our approach. There are effective intervention strategies across this, this continuum. And you can go to the next slide. And here are just a few examples of how solutions can map on to this model. But we really need this entire ecosystem to be strong, um, to be evidence-based, and to be highly scalable. You can go to the next slide, please. And so this is how um, we think about how Google's products map on to these opportunities. We believe that there are unique ways that Google can support people at every stage of their journey, whether that be in making health, making mental health information both accessible and actionable helping detect and monitor health um, at an individual level and population level, enabling access to crisis resources and care or supporting recovery. We're investing in mental health across all of our products. And now I'll walk you through a few of concrete examples of specific things that we've, that we've already done. You can go to the next slide, please. So at Google, we think of information as a determinant of health, and we have a commitment to helping our, our users access credible information. An example of this is how we have worked with the National Academy of Medicine, the WHO, and other authoritative health organizations to develop principles for defining authoritative health information. We've operationalized those principles um, inside of Google and have applied it to specific ways that our products elevate information, such as in a, a new launch um, in the last year, health source shelf on YouTube. So what you see in the, um, the phone picture on the left is now if you're, if you're looking for certain health topics on YouTube and you search, let's say depression, you'll see this kind of video carousel um, of videos that are labeled from health sources. And so this, the videos that feed into that feature all come from organizations that meet the criteria of the National Academy and the WHO as authoritative sources. We, we started with um, uh, health systems and academic journals as the, the first place of kind of criteria for authoritative sources. We've now expanded that and are, are continuing to expand to licensed health professionals, including all types of licensed mental health professionals. And so now, as we roll this out further, you'll see on YouTube that if a video is posted from a creator that meets the criteria, is licensed and agrees to our kind of authoritative health um, policies, they um, will be labeled as a licensed um, mental health professional. Our goal there is to help help educate um, individuals about how they're consuming content and from whom to reduce misinformation and elevate high quality um, information in general for health, but mental health is a particular place um, where we're focusing on this. Um, we've also applied some of this to how we um, surface answers to um, questions on search. And so we have this feature that you'll see on the right side, people also ask, um, where that also indexes from 
websites that um, meet some of the same criteria and are deemed to be kind of meeting Google standard for authoritative information. So these are just examples of ways that we're trying to overall elevate and improve the quality of health related information on our products and surfaces. You can go to the next slide, please. We know for mental health and other conditions that authoritative health information is important, but it's not sufficient. People who are actually experiencing something themselves or looking for information about to help a loved one, they want to be it, they want to relate to the person um, in the video. They want to hear from people like them. And we know that these stories of hope, of recovery, are incredibly important to somebody's, you know, recovery journey and inspiring someone to go on that journey in the first place. Um, what we've done is we've created an analogous shelf. So again, you see this kind of horizontal carousel feature on YouTube of personal stories. Um, those stories are um, coming from, they, they meet our criteria clinically where we've reviewed extensively um, to make sure that they meet the criteria that we've developed in partnership with NAMI uh, around how to share your story in a responsible way um, so that you're not inadvertently um, triggering someone who's in recovery or sharing too specific of details that could be, um, you know, could exacerbate risk for somebody who's at, at risk for developing like an eating disorder, for example. And so we've we've tried to create these features as a way of surfacing really helpful, but still high quality um, uh, content around authoritative information, around personal stories. And you'll see on search, we index the videos uh, around personal stories from, from websites that are either nonprofit or advocacy organizations or public health sites. So again, trying to elevate the quality um, of what people are seeing, but tap into that need for personal connection and inspiration. Next slide, please. It's also important to know when to seek help. And the mental health advocacy and research community has long tried to scale access to clinically validated self-assessments. We've made it easier to access these self-assessments from search and from YouTube for conditions like depression, anxiety, postpartum depression, and PTSD. These self-assessments, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, are meant to help people understand how their experience maps on to potential mental health conditions. And we've collaborated with key patient advocacy organizations such as NAMI to give actionable resources to people um, when they're searching for information after the screen. So you take, you, let's say you take the PHQ-9, when you see your results, you'll also see recommended resources um, that can help you uh, go on the next step of that journey and take action um, on the screening results to try to promote effective help-seeking behavior. Next slide, please. At, at Google, um, many people don't know we own Fitbit, <laughs> so we we run our we have a devices business where we make Pixel phones, Nest, um, Google Assistant, Fitbit, etc. And so for us, we also are thinking about how information um, can be used to empower individuals to manage their own health and and act on you know daily routines and information to try to um, you know leverage the power of that sense ambient sensing technology in the service of helping people create healthy routines. So our devices portfolio presents this unique opportunity to help people understand and act on their health and wellness information. We have just a few examples of that. On Fitbit, we have a Relax app that can guide you in deep breathing techniques. We also have um, an EDA, which is electrodermal activity sensor that can help you better understand how your body responds to stress and actually detect stress moments. Um, and that from there can help guide you to take steps to adjust your behaviors, whether that's your physical activity level, um, improve your sleep or practice mindfulness to help manage the impact of stress on your overall well-being. Next slide, please. And then moving um, around this continuum into crisis care and support. For years, Google has surfaced uh, hotlines for suicide and domestic violence on search and YouTube. On YouTube, we also surface hotlines for eating disorders now. And on search, we've actually applied our most sophisticated AI, which is called MUM, it stands for Multitask Unified Model, 
to automatically and more accurately detect personal crisis searches in 75 languages in order to show people the most relevant information when they need it. Um, as those of you who work um, in suicide prevention may know, um, a lot of the language that people actually use um, in these search queries um, evades many of the traditional language models because um, it's either coded language to try to access kind of harm seeking um, information or sites or it's, it's or it's intentionally meant to try to evade these algorithms, um, these kind of user safety algorithms or um, it, it really requires a better understanding of context. And that's one of the things that MUM is particularly skilled at doing and why Google chose to prioritize suicide as one of the first places where we applied MUM um, to search. It essentially helps us better understand the context um, around the query and the context of human language. So that's as that technology has enabled us to take a leap forward in better in, in our accuracy of detecting crisis queries and then surfacing the 988 number in the US and other local hotlines in the rest of the world. Next slide, please. Google's also committed to helping build capacity in the mental health ecosystem through our technology and talent. Since 2019, Google.org has given uh, nearly $5 million to support the work of the Trevor Project, which is, as you may know, the world's largest suicide, and pre suicide prevention and mental health organization for LGBTQ young people. And with the help of Google.org technical fellows, the Trevor Project has built an AI system that can identify and prioritize high-risk contacts while simultaneously reaching more LGBTQ young people in crisis. And in honor of World Mental Health Day this past year, we expanded our support to help them scale their digital crisis services to more countries, starting with Mexico. Um, what you see on the screen here is actually a conversation simulator. And this is something that our .org fellows helped Trevor uh, Project build as a way of scaling their volunteer training. Um, and so this essentially simulates conversations for people participating in the chat um, a crisis line. And so it, it enables more volunteers to be trained um, to their standard faster. We also, and, and what's not in the slide is our cloud um, side of our business is, is leveraging all of the best of Google's technology um, and, and cloud capabilities to enable capacity building at the government, at the public health level, working with states, working with large organizations um, to help them improve their, their infrastructure, their technological infrastructure that powers those initiatives. So um, there's a lot of ways where Google is um, working kind of on the back end of some of these mental health initiatives, in addition to what I've highlighted, which is all of our consumer focused work. Next slide, please. We, I also wanted to mention some specific work that we've done really around supporting individuals who are experiencing substance use disorders um, and their loved ones. The goal is to try to help them find helpful information and resources to support their treatment and recovery. These are just a few examples of the ways that we support the recovery community. Um, so for example, we use our most valuable real estate on search, which is the little blue text you see under the Google search and I'm feeling lucky um, buttons, you see this text, learn more about National Recovery Month. We're able to use that um, to support several different awareness um, moments throughout the year, National Recovery Month, National Drug Take Back Day. Um, in, in 2022, we supported the first ever uh, Fentanyl Awareness Day. Um, this either brings people to public health websites, or in the case of um, Recovery Month, that brings us to our Recover Together site, um, where we collate a, a, a number of resources for, for users. Um, this is really this megaphone that Google can use to raise awareness about um, public health topics. We've also built, um, on top of our maps um, capabilities, we've built a, a few things to help the recovery community. One is um, a recovery group finder. So this maps all um, AA meetings, Al-Anon, NA meetings, et cetera, to make it easier for people looking for recovery groups to find um, ones that are 
you know, it's still in operation. The other thing we've done is map drug disposal locations as well as a naloxone finder. Um, and so you can search naloxone near me and see on Google Maps um, uh, the, the locations of those uh, pharmacies. Next slide, please. One of the last things I wanted to highlight was um, one of the, the ways that we're leaning into supporting the research community, as well as just more transparency and um, understanding of the connection between technology and digital well being using our Google Health Studies platform, which is a mobile app that allows participants to join studies from research institutions that partner with Google to gain access to specific data types um, and, and actually run their studies at scale. Um, we've launched with Nick Allen as the PI, um, a study exploring the patterns of smartphone use and how they're associated with mental and physical well-being. And so this taps into a lot of our passive sensing technology with the phone, um, but is prospective informed consent study. Um, so look forward to sharing more about the results of that as it as the study proceeds. So um, with that, I'll I'll maybe wrap up and say these are just a few examples. These are things that are already launched um, and that we're really excited to build on top of and expand um, in, uh, as we go forward with this year. So thanks for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Megan. So please go ahead and I see we have uh, start, have one question, but go ahead and uh, start putting uh, the questions into the Q and A. Uh, the uh, there's one question here: uh, Do the shows do these generally get recorded? We'll put in a, um, a the the uh, URL for where the recordings show up. Um, the first question here is just: What is the AI technology called? I'm not sure which one he's referring to. But I have a lot of AI technology. The one that I talked about in terms of um, crisis support is on search is called MUM. It's called multitask unified model. Um, it's if you're if you're in, uh, into AI, the, the last Google model that we used on search was called BERT. Um, so MUM is the like a thousand times more powerful than BERT. Okay, another uh, question here. Uh, given the goal of creating personal connections uh, for the videos of recovery studies, do you use YouTube search profiles, such as how you recommended non-mental health related videos to try to match people with the videos that they may relate to? And if so, is there a risk that such matching may devolve into being driven by engagement metrics, uh, which may reward, reward outrage instead of information? If not, uh, does everyone see the same videos in the same order? Yeah, it's a great question. So we can't profile users from a health perspective. Um, so the the shelves that you see are not triggered by user characteristics. They're in response to the the query, which is basically the text that someone has typed into the um, the kind of search field on YouTube. Um, so hopefully that that answers. So that that is more those that algorithm is is really about did we answer the question with the most helpful information um it's the same way that search works um is it's really about we want to surface the most relevant information for the query not profile the user okay uh the next question uh thanks so much for this overview how do you think about what needs human clinician, uh, a human or clinician to review and what can be fully automated? It's a great question. So we use a, a, an army of clinical um, reviewers to help train our classifiers and algorithms. Um, and the, the other thing that we do that I didn't actually elaborate on is we have extensive policies for our for all Google products, whether that is um, ads, search, YouTube, I can I can maybe speak to some of the YouTube ones um, as an example. But one of the levers that we have through, if you think about YouTube, we have a few different what we call responsibility levers. This maybe helps contextualize um, how we approach user safety and, and reducing the risk of harm, because I think that's kind of the heart of the, the question. 
we have the ability with our algorithms and these product features that I described, like our health sources shelf or our personal stories shelf to raise high quality information. Um, and so this is information that either comes from a reputable source, has, has been surfaced through a classifier that has been trained, clinically trained, um, and has kind of clear um, criteria associated with it. Um, we also have the ability to reduce or remove content. And when we want to remove content, that is our policy lever. And so YouTube has, has been expanding and has policies really aimed to ensure that we want higher quality content on the YouTube platform. Policy is that kind of the lever that we can activate to make sure that there's baseline standards for the quality of information um, that people receive. So hopefully that helps answer. Thanks. Um, the next question is, uh, are the MUM search tools available as APIs for us to integrate into our tools? Via cloud. Um, so, uh, so one of the things that cloud does, it basically packages up the best of Google um, technology and enables um, organizations to, to tap into that. There are ways of tapping into Google technology through research, and I'm happy to follow up with some of the um, links that it, it, there's there's essentially two channels in to collaborate with Google as a researcher. One is through Fitbit Health Solutions, where we have, you can go to the Fitbit website, there's a portal for researchers to request access to Fitbit data or sensor data in general. There's also a, a more general channel through our university relations um, team that will essentially bridge with our research team. Um, so there are ways to work with Google. There are ways for researchers to, to tap in. Um, we also have researchers that go outside of those two opportunities and work directly with cloud um, on, on larger projects. All right. Uh, are there opportunities for private practitioners to partner with Google in developing mental health programs, apps, products? Yes, I'd say the best um, the best opportunity is as a YouTube creator is creating. So now with the um, this labeling that we offer, you can apply and I'm also happy to follow up or you can email me um, with a link to we have an app open application for individuals who are licensed mental health professionals to apply to actually have on YouTube their um, themselves labeled with this badge of licensed mental health professionals. Those videos from that creator, once you have that designation, are eligible to be included in our corpus of authoritative sources, um, which essentially boosts the visibility of the videos that you create. And um, we are really interested in closing gaps that we have on, on mental health content on the platform. We, we want more high quality, engaging, evidence-based content on YouTube. And we have the product capabilities now to elevate that, the visibility of that. So anyone who's interested in that's welcome to follow up or I can um, pull this all together and send it to, to David. <laughs> Just enough. Good, yeah, no, and we'd be happy to, to disseminate that. Um, so, uh, another the next question for detecting crises in search queries and similar endeavors do you use typing patterns to understand uh the their state of mind um that's not currently kind of how the the technology works on it's on uh search but there's as as i think many people know there's some really interesting research on um novel signals that could be used as digital biomarkers for mental health. Um, I think we've got a long way to go before we're actually pulling them into products um, because there needs to be better kind of um, benchmarking and validation by the academic community to establish kind of a ground truth before we build products um, based on them. So it's just language models right now. Um. All right. So uh, the the next one again, sort of around uh, uh, problematic uh, material. So for for YouTube, for the YouTube algorithm that selects authoritative sources, 
is there ever an issue with a person who is a certified mental health professional but is advocating information that is not credible, such as someone like Dr. Oz? Yeah, that would violate our policies. And so they would lose their designation and they would be removed from the corpus and their videos would not be eligible to be shown in any of our features. So um, there's, and if it's extremely violative, then it would just be removed. Um, so there's, there's um, our lovers are, you lose your badge, your special status as a kind of health designated creator. Um, your channel can get demonetized, your channel can get demoted, or you're just removed, or that video is removed, depending on how egregious um, it is. But we, we have standards for medical misinformation that are based on scientific consensus. So, um, and creators are obligated to abide by those policies. All right. Uh, are there any special considerations that Google makes with regard to youth, uh, those under 18 years old, searching for information about mental health and high risk topics like self harm or suicide? Yeah, I'd say all of our user safety features um, apply to youth as well. Um, for logged in users, basically individuals who we know are our youth or can reasonably identify as being under 18, there's a whole host of additional um, child safety features that um, uh, come into play. And so there's specific policies that age gate um, content that has essentially, there's a um, much higher threshold for certain content being able to be shown to youth um, because it has to meet a whole host of additional youth oriented policies on YouTube. So there's, there's extra layers of protection um, and from the YouTube side, if we identify something that is violative, that's targeting youth, we're able to, we have an, a number of mechanisms by which we can remove or address that issue. But um, essentially we, we address that uh, both with product, how we build product features and to whom they are rolled out as well as youth specific policies. Um, Okay, uh, thanks. Here's another here's another question on around um, sort of how um, sources are selected. So uh, Daniel Eisenberg, hello, Megan. Uh, I imagine that Google is always trying to strike a balance between top down practitioner uh, protections and standards such as prioritizing all uh, authoritative uh, sources, as you mentioned, versus a more organic algorithm that allows for the most relevant and popular sources to rise. Can you share more about how the company generally thinks about this balance with respect to mental health and other sensitive issues? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and that is, um, <clears throat> it, it's a major consideration. I think that given the climate, um, our general leaning in health overall has been to, you know, we don't want to be curating the ecosystem, but we also have a responsibility to address misinformation and, and harm. Um, and so, in health, it is one of the places where we we are trying to build our algorithms in a way that elevates higher quality information. And, and that one of the things that fits into that definition is authoritativeness of the source, because it's what is most easily operationalized um, and, and defined. So we don't want to be the arbiters of is what WHO is saying accurate or not? We believe that that kind of, and, and that's this external group, um, this consensus group that convene between WHO, National Academy of Medicine, Royal College of Physicians in the UK. They put together a position um, that we internalized because we didn't want to, we didn't think it's not up to Google to define what authoritative health information is or isn't, but it should be defined and we should actually bring it to life in our products. So I'd say we, our goal is always to get the query right, like answer the question to the best of our abilities. But sometimes the question is really harmful, right? Like if a user asks, how many Tylenol does it take to die? We don't want to answer that question. We want to show them 988. Um, and so there's a, depending on the circumstance, um, we believe it's our responsibility to, to, to change the way that you know, to, to intervene um, and, and reduce risk, essentially. And so we do that differently for user safety issues, health being one example. Um, all right. Uh, 
here's a, a question from Stephen Schuler. Um, how do you think about challenges of potential algorithmic bias as it comes to overcoming mental health uh, disparities? Any comments on activities at Google to address disparities? Great question. Hi, Stephen. Um, we have a health equity team um, and we have a responsible AI team that are very focused on working with our, our AI researchers to ensure that the data sets are representative um, to frankly kind of pioneer appropriate and new methods to reduce bias in these algorithms. Um, and so, so that, that we essentially have in-house experts that work and convene external um, partners and experts to develop best practices in this area. Um, I can give you a, a couple, of, I'll give you an, an analogous example that's pretty concrete. We, we have an AI tool that can diagnose diabetic retinopathy. And when we were developing that, um, decided that actually the place where we really, the greatest need for that is in LMIC countries in the, in the global south generally. Um, and so we did prospective research and, and had all of our sites for that were in Indonesia and Thailand. Um, to make sure that the, that algorithm was really developed with the right, with the intended user group in mind. We didn't want to do Google employees. We didn't want to do US. Um, we, and so that's just an example of how um, our teams are thinking about, you know, working with the right partners globally and in the US to make sure that from the very beginning, um, we, we actually build those data sets in an inclusive way. Right. I'd say we still have a long way to go, but that's um, we're we're invested in um, in that, um, and it's a it's a really important area. It sounds like an enormous effort, uh, you know, when you're thinking globally. Uh, so, next question: In the way that you index uh, helpful links, resources, uh, this you may have answered, but I'll read it. Uh, that promote positive behaviors like help seeking. What is Google doing to prevent harmful, incorrect, and especially harmful content? Um, I, I think you've kind of answered this. So, um, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions here that I'll just summarize by, uh, you know, where where do you see Google going next? Uh, where do you th see things going next? Yeah. Um, so one of our biggest levers is prevention. Um, we think that Google, as in largely our products are information platforms, that we have a tremendous opportunity and really appropriate role for Google to play in um, addressing stigma globally, rate elevate, you know, investing in mental health literacy globally, um, starting to move up the levels of prevention, you know, beyond promoting mental health um, through you know, information and, and actually there's been papers published that show some of the content on YouTube that the lived experience content reduces stigma um, and prejudice of people with mental disorders. We're moving beyond that to, and, and one of the places where we love your help um, is starting to think about how we scale access to unguided um, or self-help resources. We, we are interested in elevating um, high quality, um, and if evidence-based coping tools and um, kind of micro interventions that whether that's building things onto search, building things into Fitbit, um, but really the place where we love the larger community to contribute is on YouTube um, because with these product features that I mentioned, we really have the right foundation now for um, experts and to take these digital interventions that have been extensively researched and put them on a platform that has 2 billion monthly active users. Um, and so be because our the intention behind these health features that I described is we, we want this high quality information on YouTube because now we know we can get it in front of the right eyeballs at the right time. And so a lot of our focus on, on YouTube is in really, um, encouraging the ecosystem, seeing YouTube as a place to, to put this work, um, design engaging content um, and work with us to scale the access to it. So that category, you know, I really think of as prevention across our products is, is a major focus. When it comes to 
seeking care and um, helping. We see our role really as being this intermediary. We're not develop, you know, we're not planning to offer therapy on search. Um, we're not, we're not personally, you know, as a one P um, solution going to be developing um, interventions to treat or manage conditions. Um, we do have some, you know, regulated products for other health conditions, um, but for, for mental health, we really want to have mechanisms by which we are um, elevating the visibility of resources. Um, you can see what we're doing in other health topics as an analogous example. So if, in the US, we have a partnership with CVS Health, where if you search flu shot near me or COVID vaccine near me, you'll see on maps and in the search results, um, these one click buttons to make an appointment at the nearest CVS Minute Clinic for a, a vaccine. Um, we're expanding that to other things. Um, on our, our maps, we also are, are mapping um, Medicare and Medicaid eligible um, uh, providers is so that people can better identify um, and find a provider near them that takes it, their insurance. Um, we surface the maximum out of pocket copay. Um, so there are a number of things that we're trying to do around the discoverability of local um, resources that are, you know, in, in general for health, as well as kind of adjacent social um, services, which are, are important to kind of have that bigger picture of pulling in the social determinants um, piece to some of these, these queries and searches. So um, yeah, so, so that's the second pillar, the third being crisis. Um, so as I mentioned, our, our kind of longest legacy work has been in the suicide prevention space. Um, and we are really interested in building on that and trying to say the hotline is the MV is like the minimum viable thing that we can do for people. We are interested in, and we have been scaling that to other countries, but we would like to, to be, you know, continue to work with the academic and um, advocacy community to expand the ways that were helpful to people in a crisis. So, um, that's, that's our plan, doing that in different ways across products. Um, and I'd say there's, there's a lot of room for, for um, people to contribute both in developing best practices, helping us um, fill YouTube with high quality um, content and interventions and, and even trainings, right? So we have content on YouTube that's targeted health um, care professionals themselves to scale up their ability to deliver evidence-based treatment. So there's a lot of ways um, that, it, you know, all of you can contribute. Uh, thanks. And the, the comments that you were making there on, uh, on, on location-based stuff kind of set up the next question. Uh, does Google have curated stats on drug usage, suicides, et cetera, by different regions, campuses, and so on, so we can understand which geographies, campuses uh, are vulnerable or not? And so I guess sort of larger, I'm also curious, like, how do you, how do you look at location with, uh, you know, in terms of risk or do you? Yeah, we don't look at that. Um, and we don't store that kind of data. Um, as you may recall from how we talked about, um, you know, abortion um, related information, there's essentially kind of a, a black box of category of, of health topics where we don't store any information. We answer the query, we'll give you directions to where you need to go, but it's not stored. Substance use disorder, mental health in general are in that category along with abortion. Um, so we have, um, it's essentially in our privacy policies and practices, mental health and, and especially um, substance use disorder, things that can be used against an individual or are really stigmatized or just extremely private um, and sensitive health information is, um, you know, we, 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 we just don't even, our, our intention is not to keep it in the first place. Um, I'd say there are things that we do for at the public health level um, for other health topics. So that I can just give you an example of some of our capabilities and our, our, our public health. For COVID, um, one of the first things that we did was build these um, community mobility reports that aren't really relevant now, but at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, you'll remember that public health authorities really needed to know if their 
um, populations were abiding by the stay at home orders. And so around the world, we were able to surface these reports to public health authorities that showed mobility of their population, not at all at, at kind of really at a de-identified aggregate level um, to understand the effectiveness of some of these efforts to get people to stay um, in place. So where we believe there's a, you know, a, a need um, by public health authorities, we do develop um, some of these kind of larger data sets um, for mental health that does not exist though. All right, uh, is Google able to look at health outcomes either at a population level or individual level, uh, for example, those using Fitbit? Yes, Fitbit is um, Fitbit can be very easily wrapped in evaluation. Um, we have thousands of researchers using Fitbit in their research. Um, we have APIs for researchers. Um, and so there's, uh, and then we do our own, we have our own internal research team that evaluates the impact of, um, of Fitbit in a variety of different conditions, populations, settings. Um, but absolutely, we do have the ability across our products to do um, evaluation um, in different ways. The methods vary, as you might imagine. Um, but we are we are really committed to understanding: is what we're doing even you know how does what is the effectiveness of these inter these interventions and um, features that we're building? Um, but certainly on our devices side, we've got great research infrastructure to enable. Um, collaboration and use of use of our our devices in novel signals. All right. Um, so, which data sets, uh, including crisis text line data sets, are available to study, and how can they be accessed? Um, there's no crisis data sets. Um, okay. So, yeah, those are those are we don't store that information. Yeah, I'd say for for mental health for for Fitbit um, as a researcher, you can with the IRB approval, apply to be granted access to the Fitbit Research API. Um, and so then for consented participants in your study, you'd be able to pull in sleep data, stress, kind of electrodermal um, activity data, HRV, um, essentially the, um, we've, we have a collection of APIs that pertain to Fitbit's sensing capabilities and enable researchers to to leverage those in um, uh, IRB approved studies. All right, um, here's a question kind of getting at the specificity of your suicide prevention work. So uh, one of the challenges in the in the suicide prevention world in the US is the intersection of state specific legislation and suicide prevention principles. Uh, one example is safe firearm storage in some states, it may be legal to temporarily store a firearm with a friend or uh, another unlicensed person if someone is at risk for suicide, and in other states, this would not be allowed. Is there any way that Google has considered layering geographic or specific restrictions or the result uh, or results and laws as a dimension of their mental health specific research, uh, mental health specific search results? Uh, for example, would Google ever consider offering state specific or region specific results for where and how someone can temporarily store a firearm. Uh, I wonder if there are other complex mental health related topics that have this hyper these hyper local impacts uh, on what might be legal or relevant. I'd say it's absolutely in the realm of possibilities. I can just transparently say our priority is global coverage. Um, and so where our focus is having a reasonable baseline in every country before we get hyper local. Um, and, and specifics, the, essentially it's this kind of ethical decision of, is it better to have some suicide prevention effort everywhere or a really elaborate um, one in certain kind of high income countries? So our priority is, is, is really building, um, building for global right now before we move more into the, the kind of state specific, um, so. All right. Um, so this is maybe touching on your background in intervention development. Uh, so would Google or YouTube consider going beyond digital information and create massive open video interventions based on evidence-based interventions for depression, anxiety, alcohol problems, et cetera? 
Uh, this could obtain extremely large uh, sample studies to see what works uh, with the most people worldwide. Build it. Work with us. We love <laughs> to do that. As it's like you know my favorite thing to do. So <laughs> you can be sure we're interested. Um, and it it is very consistent with the way that we the, kind of the tools that we've built. Um, we the thing that we need are um, expert creators to come think of YouTube as a platform um, to to design and and then evaluate interventions. Okay. Um... Is Google researching the use of VR uh, and or AR technologies to promote awareness and empathy for mental health disorders? Yeah, it's, it's not something that we um, are kind of have anything that we've, we've done that I can talk about in that area at the moment. Um, Is Google leveraging social media data and user demographics such as from YouTube to make predictions about mental health risks? No, we don't, that's a privacy violation. Okay. Um, a lot of these have already been asked in one way or another. Yeah, uh, so we're, yeah. But, but I'll just say like the, the private, the intersection of our ability to be helpful and privacy is a really complex challenge. Um, and it's one that we, you know, there's a lot of regulation around that. Um, and I think, you know, certainly a, a lot of ethical deliberation, <laughs> moral deliberation that's needed um, around, you know, what we can, what we should do there. But right now I'd say we're, we're taking a conservative stance on, on privacy, especially given the climate um, in the US. All right, here's one that I think a lot of people are asking uh, themselves at this point. If we're interested in working uh, at or with Google with these initiatives, who should we contact? You can email me. Um, I will do my best to be your air traffic control for Google. Um, it's a, a large, complex organization, but um, if so, my email address I can put in the chat, it's just Megan Jones Bell, it's my name at Google. Um, and, and thank you for your patience as I respond. <laughs> All right, um, and then uh, from Jesse Lipschitz, she says, hello, Megan. Uh, has Google ever worked with government uh, or, uh, or the, the World Health Organization to show trends in things like increased suicide searches, mental health provider searches, et cetera? It seems like much of the mobility data that you just mentioned for COVID, uh, some de-identified data on this at the population level could be hugely useful to identify trends. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting direction. Um, I'd say we work closely with governments. We look at, work very closely with the WHO and across many of our um, health and, and mental health specific efforts. So um, say there's there's a lot of opportunities that being a great example of one. All right. Uh, and from uh, Joe Ruzek, uh, is, is Google uh, developing disaster mental health response capabilities and what would they look like? Yeah, I'll say we for all of the major disasters, wars, et cetera, um, it, it's been a consideration in our overall response, um, really thinking about and working closely with aid organizations on kind of what is the what is the what kind of information and resources do people in humanitarian crisis zones need? We have a team that specializes in that internally. Um, we've, we've responded to um, in, in a very customized way for you know, the Ukraine crisis and, and other humanitarian crises. So I'd say it's um, something we, we actively work on. We do you know, lean on the aid organizations to inform us about what are the user needs so that we're not presumptuous about, um, you know, so that we're really anchored to, to Helping them prioritize, um, so helping ourselves prioritize, you know, what the um, what's actually going on in the local context and how we think about kind of building the right um, tools for them. So, yes, we have very rapid responses, and um, it's uh, it's an important part of our work, public health work. All right. Well, I think we're at the we are at the top of the hour. So. Um... Thank you so much, Megan. This has been this has been wonderful to get uh, get a peek into how things are working at at, at Google. 
Um, and and so thank you, thank you very very much. Uh, the video the video will be posted along with all of the others. There were a few questions about uh, where the videos can be found. I just uh, placed the, the URL in the chat. Um, and then next next month in February, Sarah Becker is going to be talking about implementation research, uh, improving the uptake of, of youth substance abuse services for digital health. In March, Michael Schoenbaum will be talking about viable payment mechanisms for effective digital health therapies. And, and uh, in April, Joe Glass and Teresa Matson will be talking about a framework uh, for a trial design being used by Kaiser Permanente. So um, stay tuned. And Megan, thank you again. And I hope to catch up with you at some point. All right. Thanks. All right. And, and wonderful to see so many familiar names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.